Grace, mercy, and peace be to you from God, our Father, and our Lord and Savior, Jesus the Christ. Amen. If you say someone is blind, it can mean one of two things, as I shared during the children's message moments ago. It can either mean they're physically blind, which is, can be a, a temporary state induced by a blindfold or in a dark room, um, or it can be something they're born with, as is the case with the man uh, in our gospel reading today, or it can be something that develops as a result of disease or just over time um, in old age. But the other way is that they're metaphorically blind. In the case of our gospel reading, this is spiritual blindness, but really more in general it refers to the idea that somebody doesn't understand the thing that they're seeing or the thing that you're saying. Or to use the words of our scriptures, they don't have eyes that see or ears that hear. This is also the case of the man who's born blind in our gospel account. He has this spiritual blindness as well. But in our text today, Jesus shows that he has authority to deal with both of these kinds of blindness. So there's a lot of there's a lot in this that's going on in the story. So we're just going to kind of go through it scene by scene, and then we're going to break down what we are getting out of this text. Why was it shared with us? So the first scene is, of course, Jesus is passing by, and it says that he sees this man who's been born blind, and he must be staring at him pretty hard because even his sometimes thick-headed disciples notice it, and they ask him a question. They say, Rabbi. Who sinned, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? And Jesus teaches them that it isn't a result of any particular sin that has caused this, but that the works of God might be displayed in him. What a wonderful way to look at the sufferings and ailments of our world, opportunity for God to display his work and his might. Perhaps you know somebody like this who has even more reason than most people to be angry and frustrated about the lot they've been given in life. Maybe it is a blind person that you know. And when those sorts of people, whether they're healed physically or not, bear witness to the glory of Jesus, it's another thing entirely. It's a very powerful witness. So Jesus is teaching that that's why this man is where he's at and why he has his blindness, so that God can be his work can be displayed in him. So then Jesus repeats the teaching that he is the light of the world. So he's come to bring light into the world. And then he spits on the ground and makes some mud. And it'll be important to note that this act of making mud is specifically prohibited on the Sabbath. So he spits and makes mud and covers the man's eyes with it and tells him, go wash in the pool of Siloam. And so the man goes and does, and his sight is restored. Now, it's important to note that this is specifically said that he is blind from birth. So there's no doubt about the nature of the healing here. It isn't that he had some bacteria in his eye that the mud and the water washes out, but his eyes were restored by God. Well, then we get to the next scene. As you may know, somebody who's been begging and they've been blind from birth, people know about this guy, they recognize him, and all of a sudden he's walking around and he can see. So people take notice of that, and some of them think it's just some guy that looks like him because blind people don't miraculously start seeing again, right? And other people say, no, I think it's him, and he goes around saying, no, that's me, I'm the guy, I'm the guy who was blind. And they ask him what happened, and he tells them, this guy named Jesus spit on the ground and made mud and covered my eyes with it and told me to go wash in the pool of Siloam, and I did, and here I stand before you seeing. So people aren't sure what's going on, so they go and get the Pharisees, and the Pharisees are brought to him, and they ask him, tell us what this man did. And here we get the Sabbath controversy, because Jesus made mud making mud was prohibited on the Sabbath. It was a work that you weren't supposed to do. And so they're divided because some of them say, well, he can't be from God. He's violated the Sabbath. 
which happens a number of times between Jesus and the Pharisees. And so they ask the blind man, he, he restored your sight, what do you think of him? And he says, he's a prophet. We get to scene three. The Pharisees, well, they don't really believe that this guy has had his sight restored. They can't believe it. And so what do they do? They call some witnesses if he's been blind from birth. Who would know that better than his parents? And so they call his parents uh, to witness to them about whether or not this is really true. Because at this point, they think it's just all made up. And his parents say, well, this is our son, and he was indeed born blind. But if you were to ask us how he's now seeing, we don't know. And we don't know who it is that has done this for him. But then they do something interesting. They say, why are you asking us? Ask him. He's an adult. He can speak for himself. And then John tells us why they do this. Because it's already been said that if you confess that Jesus is the Christ, you will be cast out of the synagogue. That means, for modern day ears, that you are excommunicated from the community of the synagogue. And they were afraid of that, quite naturally. It's a scary thing to be cut off from your community. And so they say, well, go talk to him, because they didn't want to get caught in the middle of it. Which brings us to scene four. The Pharisees, they summon the man born blind a second time, and they ask him again. But interestingly, they start this second interview, this second interrogation, with a statement that says, give glory to God, we know that this man, Jesus, is a sinner. So right away they're trying to divorce this miracle from Jesus, because they don't want this guy going around and telling people that Jesus healed his blindness, because they know that from the Old Testament the one who restores sight to the blind is one of the signs of the Messiah. And we begin to see how unique this healing is as the blind man speaks. His response to their first statement is, well, I don't know about whether or not he's a sinner, but what I do know is that I was blind and now I'm not blind. And the Pharisees ask him again, well, tell us what he did. Presumably, our thinking is that they're trying to figure out the trick, the catch. But the blind man has had enough and he says, I already told you what he did. Why do you want me to say it again? And then he, then he follows it up with, well, do you also want to be his disciples? Which that, if you want to make the Pharisees mad, say something like that. And the also in there is a key word. Because the man who was born blind now seems to indicate that he wants to follow this Jesus who's healed him. Well, what was the response of the Pharisees? They revile him. It's a very strong language. They're disgusted that this man born in utter sin is trying to teach them, and the Pharisees, the learned men of religion, the pure, anything about God. And they say, no, we are disciples of Moses, and we know he came from God. This man, we don't recognize him as someone coming from God. But then the blind man you would think maybe in the context of this setting, he would be kind of timid and maybe that would bowl him over, but he's gaining boldness as we go along in the story. And he responds to them and points out that no one since the beginning of the world has healed somebody who's been blind from birth. It's never been seen. And he says if he weren't from God, then he could do nothing. And how is he rewarded for his witness about Jesus? He's cast out. So you notice the first time when he says Jesus is a prophet, he doesn't get cast out of the synagogue, but now he's from God. And if he wasn't from God, he could do nothing, and he is cast out. So he's growing in his understanding of who Jesus is, but he's not quite there yet. And this brings us to scene five, the last scene of our gospel account today. Jesus hears that this guy has been cast out of the synagogue. And he goes and finds him. Jesus asks him, do you believe in the Son of Man? And here's where we know that the blind man doesn't quite know exactly what's going on to him yet. He says, 
well, sir, who's this guy so that I can believe in him? Because I bet at this point he's thinking, whatever Jesus says, I'm going to do because he restored my sight. And then, of course, Jesus then in his own words reveals himself. The one, you've seen him before, and the one speaking to you now is him. Then what does he do? He says his confession of faith, Lord, I believe, and then he worships him. And the Scriptures are extremely careful about the worship of man. It's only attributed to God. In many visions in the Old Testament, the prophet is overawed by the presence of an angel, and he's tempted to bow down and worship him, and he's very quickly corrected. No, 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 don't worship me. I'm like you. I worship God. And here the man worships Jesus. that ends this account, this scene between Jesus and the man born blind. And then Jesus makes some statements of His teaching, and the big one here is, for judgment I came into this world, that those who do not see may see, and those who see may become blind. Did you notice, as the events of this account unfolds, the physical blindness that is healed at the beginning, the supposed amazing work of God begins to take a back seat progressively with each scene to make way for an even greater healing, an even greater development. The man born blind who was healed doesn't believe in Jesus at first. Even after he's healed, he doesn't get it. He says after his first questioning, he's a prophet. Well, a prophet's very different from the Son of Man, the Messiah. And he's not cast out. But his second testimony, he starts to think about what's happened to him, and he wants to follow Jesus, and he bears witness about this guy. I don't know who he is yet, but he's from God. For if he wasn't, he wouldn't have been able to heal me. And he's cast out for his troubles. You see, Jesus hasn't come for the temporary healing. He does that sometimes just like He does here with the man who was born blind. He heals His physical blindness, but He tells us from the very beginning that the reason that He is doing that is to display God's mighty works. What is God's mighty work? It is the curing of spiritual blindness for all who have faith in Jesus. The other important thing to notice here is that can seem really intimidating. How can I come to believe in Jesus if He doesn't show up and spit and put mud on my eyes and tell me to go wash and heal me from some indeterminably unhealable disease? Well, if you notice, all of the movements between Jesus and the blind man begin with Jesus. Jesus sees him and heals him. And when he hears that he's been cast out for bearing witness about him, he doesn't wait for him to come back around. He goes and finds him. And what does he do when he finds him? He reveals himself so that he may believe. Dear friends in Christ, this is what God does for us. We're like the man born blind. We can't see We can't see Jesus. We can't see the things of God. And if we couldn't see them, we'll never know when He's here. And if it were us having to be the blind man finding Jesus, approaching Jesus, we would have no hope at all. But we do have such hope because Jesus finds us. He heals our spiritual blindness. He sees you and He sees me. And He sees us lost as if we have no shepherd and is moved by His compassion and His desire to glorify the work of God, and He heals us. Now, sometimes even today, physical healing occurs because Jesus has authority over that. Whether it's the answer to a prayer through a miraculous healing no one can explain, or whether it's through the means that He's created, through doctors and nurses, through medicine, whatever in order to give glory to God. Sometimes He does that, but we all know that sometimes He doesn't. 
Because Jesus isn't really here for that. He's here for the bigger work, the mightier work, the opening of the eyes of the spiritually blind, the creation and gift of faith, so that we, like the blind man, can say, Lord, I believe and worship Him. You see, our God always brings to us spiritual healing. The baptismal font to which you are placed in. When the pastor, through the physical eyesight, just puts some water on your head and says some words, but now that you have eyes to see, we know that that kills the old Adam and brings to life a new creation, a beloved child of God wrapped in the righteous robes of Jesus given eyes to see and ears to hear, so that when when Jesus is standing right in front of us, we can see Him and believe. Dear friends in Christ, give thanks to God, for you have eyes that see and ears that hear because of the grace of Jesus. Let's close with a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, we give you thanks and praise for your grace and mercy in sending Jesus. Jesus who sees us and is moved by His compassion and His love. Jesus who heals us and finds us in our distress and reveals Himself to us. He reveals us by His Word and through the gifts of His sacraments so that we can see Him, be near Him, and receive Him, so that we can see and believe. Lord, help us say, Lord, I believe and worship You. In Your name we pray. Amen.